Well, good morning. Uh, I have to say this. I love soup in the fall and the winter. Like there is something comforting and warm about having soup. And I love potato corn chowder and bean chili and asparagus soup and tomato soup. I love trying new soups. And to, uh, to be quite honest with you, I love soup so much that I even eat soup in the winter. I mean, in the summer, I made a couple different soups last week. I made a white bean sweet potato soup with ginger and garlic and a little bit of cayenne pepper, and it was delightful. Uh, And as it is with recipes, I didn't have all of the ingredients. So I had to tweak the recipe just a little bit. But most of the time, the author of the recipe... They've tested and they've tweaked and they know just the right amounts and they know just the right ingredients to make the best flavor. God is the author of life and has created us. And when we recognize that God has created us with just the right ingredients and we live into that, we find joy. Now, as we dig into what it means to for real love your neighbor, we find joy ourselves. Now, maybe you might be asking, like, wait a minute, isn't this about loving our neighbors? Uh, Shouldn't we be focusing on our neighbors? Well, ironically, starting with joy means that we focus not on our neighbors first, but rather we focus and understand ourselves first. Joy, the way the neighboring movement defines it, is the process, the process of communicating, uh, the process of discovering and then seeking to live aligned to the values and principles which we hold close. So joy for the neighboring movement is the process of discovering authenticity and then seeking to live that out in our lives. Now, one helpful way to understand the kind of joyful living that God wants for us is to consider the moments when we are not experiencing joy. Now, in our scripture passage that we're going to dig into to today, the main character seems to find himself in one of those moments. Now, maybe when you think of joy, you immediately think of the character from the movie Inside Out, or now Inside Out 2. And if you don't know, these movies are about the emotions in a young girl's mind. That's, those are the characters in, in the movie. And there's joy, and there's sadness, and there's anger, and there's fear and disgust. And then as Riley, the, the girl, as she moves into adolescence, then she, is, uh, uh, she has added emotions to her, to her brain. So just for fun, guess the emotion. Who said this in the movie? Hey, look! The Golden Gate Bridge, isn't it great? It isn't made of solid gold like we thought, which is kind of a disappointment, but still. Joy, obviously. Uh, Remember the funny movie where the dog died? Sadness. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We should lock the door and scream that curse word we know. It's a good one. Anger. You can't focus on what's going wrong, but there's always a way to turn things around to find the fun. Joy. Uh, How about this one? We all suffer and we all triumph and we all get to choose how we hold both. That's a trick one because that's not found in the movie. Uh, It turns out when I was Googling like inside out quotes, uh, Demi Moore (laughs) Um, wrote a memoir that's called Inside Out, and this is her quote, but I thought this was pretty, pretty telling. This is a pretty good quote. When, when, as the movie Inside Out undercovers for us, joy is not always about being happy. It's not always about uh, uh, being happy, because we know life hold th- holds things like joy and anger and sadness and fear and all of the other emotions. But instead, joy is finding our authentic self and living into that. 
living often, 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 no, I'm not going to even say that word, living as we are supposed to live, as God created us, is one of the three ingredients of neighboring. And it, and it brings us joy, but that doesn't, again, always mean happy and bubbly. It means knowing who you are, our purpose in life, and that we are defined and accepted and invited by God. Now, our scripture today comes from Acts chapter 8. It's the story about Philip and the eunuch. Now, a eunuch is a castrated male, either from a birth defect or other. And many eunuchs were sold into their roles by their parents because their parents had really no other choice. And the wealthiest individuals in the ancient world often employed eunuchs. They employ them to uh, guard their most prized possessions and because they kind of assume that their circumstances, being a eunuch, would prevent them from holding any other loyalties. So the Old Testament has a lot to say about eunuchs because God's covenant with Israel was largely connected of, to, to spreading seed. Now, we find that the eunuch in chapter 8 has, he has been on this spiritual journey, this, uh, this kind of an extreme spiritual journey. And he has been on this pilgrimage to Jerusalem where he went to the temple to worship, but uh, it's, it's well known that he couldn't go inside the temple because that was outlawed. And so he went to this temple, and the religious leaders, they they reject the eunuch. But the eunuch goes away, and he still has this spiritual hunger that has not been fulfilled. Now, it's probably safe to assume that this eunuch has been defined by his identity as a eunuch throughout his entire life. I can relate to this in my own way, having my identity based on various situations and facts about me. I'm the youngest in my family, and so I had to, or at least I felt like I had to prove myself to my older siblings. I'm a a woman pastor, and even though it became pretty clear to me that God was calling me to this, sometimes I have to prove that I even have the authority to speak in a church. Then I also define myself by my mistakes, mistakes I've made as a parent, mistakes I've made as a friend, big mistakes that I've made as a wife. And I think about all of these things, like could I possibly be defined just by all of these things? But when I live my life, not trying to live into any expectations or molds that the world might have for me, but only living in the reality, knowing that God loves me, that God believes in me, that God's rooting for me, that God is a God of forgiveness and God of grace, then I discover my genuine self, the self that God created me to be. But that took some years to realize, and I often need to be reminded of it. Now, maybe you need to be reminded of it too, because I'm guessing that you have a whole list of things that you define yourself to. Uh, we kind of call it that I'm just a, I'm just a girl, I'm, I'm just a man, I'm just a teenager, I'm just the youngest, I'm just a worker, I'm just a whatever it is that you'll fill in the blank with. And our scripture pas- passage today can help us discover or rediscover our worth, our worth found in something greater than anything that those things that we could define ourselves by. It's about someone who found joy through, li- through the living water that Jesus offers. The story is about a man who went from being unwelcomed to finding joy through the lesson of a life measured and validated not by anything but the fact that God is a God for everyone. And that Jesus came to save the whole world. 
Our VBS final Bible point the last night was God is a friend for everyone. That's exactly, <laughs> okay, let's try it. God is a friend for everyone. Okay, all right, good. Uh, that, that's exactly what this story teaches us. Now, again, this story is found in Acts chapter 8, and I'm not going to read the whole story today, but I, I'll invite you to dig into the whole story later. So this is Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip, At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Candace is the title given to the Ethiopian queen. Now, this word Ethiopian, it doesn't mean that he was from Ethiopia, as in the country that we know today. But Ethiopia was the land of black people, uh, or translated actually to the land of burned faces. That's how it's translated. And Philip runs up to this carriage. The spirit led him there, and the Philip runs up to this carriage and, and, and saw this Ethiopian eunuch reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And Philip wondered if the eunuch could possibly understand what he was reading. And so he asked the, the eunuch that. And the eunuch replied, like, without someone to guide me, how could I understand what I'm reading? So Philip climbed in and read from Isaiah. And then jumping to verse 35, it says, Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from getting baptized? What would keep me from being baptized? Now, the prophet Isaiah wasn't really predicting the future, but rather Isaiah was contemplating on God's promises to Israel, despite Israel's failure to be the light to all the nations. And so Isaiah, upon praying and contemplating and, and, and thinking and meditating, like he uncovers a picture. He uncovers this picture of a servant, one who would come and complete the promise, allowing us, everyone, a chance to know a kind of everlasting joy. And it's almost as if Isaiah was writing this job description of how God intended to restore the world. And then Jesus came and he fit that job description. So the eunuch was reading from Isaiah chapter 53 and it says they started there and, 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 and Philip explained the good news of Jesus. Because if you go to, to Isaiah 54, it talks about this new covenant. And then Isaiah 55 talks about the new creation. And then in Isaiah 56, there's this blessing even for outsiders, for foreigners, and yes, even for eunuchs. Can you imagine Philip and the eunuch having this conversation, reading this scripture passage to, together? And then, and then maybe at this point, maybe the eunuch is testing Philip. Philip is claiming that there's this good news for everyone, but I'm sure the eunuch was like, is this good news for everyone? What are the requirements? What, what's, what's the check boxes to be in the club of Jesus followers? And so he asks the question to Philip. He, he, he sees the water and he says, Philip, like, what is keeping me from this living water? What's keeping me from being baptized? And the answer was nothing. There was nothing that kept him or keeps us from the living water. And Philip orders the carriage to stop, and they went to the water, and the, and the eunuch was baptized, and then the scripture says this. 
he went on his way rejoicing. He found joy because he was no longer defined by anything other than knowing that Jesus died for the whole world, even for him. This black man who didn't fit the norms of society or the command to create children, he was accepted without question. Can you imagine the the conversation that this eunuch had with other eunuchs or other people on the fringes? He's like, he probably said something like, you'll never guess what happened. I learned about the good news of Jesus, that Jesus came into the world not to condemn, but to save the whole world through him, including me. Everyone is invited. Now, there are people all over our world today on their own desert road. They're wandering on these wilderness roads trying to find where they fit in. People longing for some sort of spiritual connection of some sort. And maybe that's, maybe that's you. Maybe you're not even certain if you are welcome here. Well, if you have ever wondered how the early church read the scriptures, if you ever wondered how, how the early church grew, this story is at the heart of what it looked like. This story is one of inclusion and boldness and one that, that, that didn't let anything get in the way of a believer wanting to know more. This story shows that there is a place for you at the table, which is one of Horizon's values. It's one that the early church embodied. It's one that Jesus embodied. Now, if you're not a Christian or not a Christian anymore, and maybe part of the problem uh, was the church excluding you or uh, someone in your family, um, the church, we, we have done some pretty significant harm throughout history. Thousands of years we've done harm to certain groups of people, to women, to minorities, to divorced people, to those in the LGBTQ plus community. And I am sorry for that harm. That's not the message of Jesus. That is not the good news of Jesus. The world is loud. The world tells us who we should exclude and who we should include, but how do we make the message of Jesus louder? When you discover or rediscover the joy of living an authentic life, You can imagine Jesus standing right there, looking you in the eye, saying, you are loved. Philip was a neighbor. He was a neighbor who was willing to to help this eunuch see that he was beloved, that he was held by God. And because of that and the Spirit's work, the eunuch gained access to joy. And if later tradition is believed, this eunuch became the first evangelist in his own native country. A good neighbor indeed. And we think like, okay, who, who who might we be able to help find joy? Now last week I invited you to share some neighboring stories with me maybe about how you are a good neighbor or how you've been helped by a neighbor. And I gathered a couple stories. If you have more stories, please share them with me. But I want to share one story with you today. This story, this was an email I got from uh, Kristen Van Meter and about how her and her family are, are being neighborly. And she said that she has, uh, they have one neighbor who is battling throat cancer 
and has had several surgeries and chemotherapy. And she said that when, when they're out of town for treatments or such, that her husband and son, they go over and they mow and they help with the garden to keep things going. She said that she gives them cars just to let them know that, that they're, she's praying for them. And she's given them gifts like a blanket and candle and a, a marker board to help him communicate because of his throat cancer. They have another neighbor who they give toys and clothing and books to, like things that their own boys have outgrown, and they bless them with that kind of resource. And then they have another couple, one uh, who lives across the street from them, and she said that they frequently help transport their son to and from school uh, when, when their work schedules were just too hectic. Now here's what's great about what the van meters are doing with their neighboring. Their neighbors are great examples of different families with diverse characteristics that make up our unique world. The neighbors that they are helping, one is an elderly couple. One is a couple with a child who has special needs. One is a gay couple. Like that is, that's our neighborhoods. That's what our neighborhoods are made up of, various persons and personalities and blended families and single people and all all the other ways that we can define families. And everyone should have an opportunity to have a good neighbor and, and to ultimately experience joy. And then Kristen closed her email And she summed up exactly what can happen when we accept God's love and know that we belong because of Jesus. Kristen said this. She said, "Loving, showing the love of God is so important. I have such gratitude. I have such joy for what Jesus has done for me. I want to show love to others to express my love for him. That is how we can be good neighbors. The first ingredient in neighboring is finding that joy. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, help us to discover joy through your invitation that that all come to the living water. Help us to continue to seek you with the same passion that the Ethiopian eunuch had, a passion for wanting to dig into the scripture, a passage to to wanting to know more, a passage to want to come to the living water. And help us to take that joy and to experience that joy and then bring it to our neighborhood so that we might know the love of Jesus, but so that all might know the love of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Guide us on this journey that we are on. Help us to be bold when we need to be bold. Help us to, to think uh, like, like, like fill up and be led by the Spirit to where God is calling us to be and to be led into situations where maybe we don't think the same. Or maybe you don't look the same. But help us to show God's love to everyone that we encounter. And we say all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.